Now, how some schools are dealing with a very difficult question surrounding consent, assault, allegations, and consequences. That conversation was happening prior to the claims made against Judge Kavanaugh. But as William Brangham tells us, this new information, this new situation has given momentum to what some see as a teachable moment. It's the focus of this week's education segment, Making the Grade. In a minute, we'll look at the different ways that schools are grappling with this moment in time. But first, let's hear from some students. Before last week's hearing with Christine Blasey Ford and Brett Kavanaugh, our own student reporting labs asked teenagers around the country this question. Should adults be held accountable for the things they did when they were younger? Here's some of what they had to say. As a teenager, you're always told how what you do now can affect your future. So I think accountability is really important. I think once that they've paid the consequence, then it, people should just move on from it and it should be over with. During your teenage years, you're more prone to like make mistakes and learn from them, but it does depend on like the severity on the mistakes that you do um, take part in as a teenager. I think that a big part of being a teenager is doing irresponsible things that probably um, are not in our best interests in order to learn and grow from them. I do believe that some of their actions, some of their major life choices that they make as teenagers, they should be held accountable for it. When it comes to things like rape allegations and drug possession and DUIs, those things stay with you for life for a reason. And I think that those things we should bring up later. This generation's more aware of protecting their brand because we have social media, unlike my parents' generation where they could do something and it not be documented or, you know, seen by everyone in the school. Social media literally, like, everyone finds out about everything. So nothing's technically ever gone. As teens, we gotta watch what we post because, you know, you read what you sow and then it can eventually come back on you later. Say getting a job, like, they can look on your Facebook and see all that stuff you post and think, hey, it's not the person I wanna hire. Those were students from across the U.S. interviewed by the NewsHour's student reporting labs. How schools and administrators and teachers deal with this event is a whole different issue. And here with me now is Education Week's Evie Blood. Welcome back. Thank you. So this is a very fraught moment for the country, and I'm curious what your reporting is showing is how are schools handling this? It's obviously a very divisive issue, and it's one that Students bring their own personal experiences, the things they're hearing from their family and friends, and their own understanding of the news and events to the table. It fits in with the context of civics education conversations that have been pretty intense in the last couple of years as students have been more engaged with the news and with a really divisive political climate. It also fits in with this um, understanding of the Me Too movement, which folks had hoped that students would be listening and personalizing some of the conversations about consent and power and decision making. Um, but this is one of the first big high profile stories in recent years that has centered on behavior that took place when um, both the alleged assailant and the alleged victim were in high school. And so in some ways, students can relate to it and personalize it a lot more easily. I was really struck in the reporting about how during the course of the hearings when they were being televised that uh, calls to sexual violence hotlines went up by one account almost 200 percent. And I'm curious, is, has that happened at the schools as well? Have children been somehow moved by this to say, I'm now going to share my own story? Right. We talked to some victims advocacy groups who said, you know, it's a little too early to tell exactly how this is affecting women in certain groups um, or, or uh, people in general. Um, but there are groups that are trying to kind of capitalize on this moment, trying to use it to take um, to help students to personalize, think about and process issues like consent. Um, they've started a hashtag called MeTooK12. They're encouraging people to share their stories about experiences they had when they were younger. And some of the biggest learning for students that's happening about these issues is not discussing the allegations specifically against Judge Kavanaugh, but some of the secondary stories that are coming out of it. Um, when the president tweeted recently that he believed that Dr. Ford um, should have or would have 
shared those allegations with police when she was younger, um, there was a hashtag why I didn't report circulating on Twitter right. that talked about some of the barriers and some of the reasons that this can be a really complicated issue for victims. And um, that could be a teachable moment for students. Obviously, we live in a very diverse country, different religious traditions, different cultural values. How does, I mean, when you talk about the issue of consent in particular, do schools teach that as part of a sex ed curriculum? What schools teach in America about sex education is a uh, really uh, varied patchwork. Um, a lot of what is decided about what taught, is taught in the classroom is set by state mandates, and states have very different ideas about what schools should teach, what they should be prevented from teaching, and what decisions should be left up to them. There is a growing movement to focus less on specific behaviors, contraceptives, and things like that, and to focus more broadly on decisional decision making and uh, developing a personal ethic. Um, and there are some conversations about consent that are coming into play. Um, um, having students discuss real life situations, the difficulties of the decisions they may face, the impact of those decisions. And there are some states that are really moving forward with some, um, some new mandates. In California, for example, a couple of years ago created a law that requires state schools that teach sex ed in K-12 um, to teach affirmative consent, which is basically yes means yes, rather than mm. no means no. In every school? Yes. but. That is far more progressive than some states' policies, which are a little more restrictive because there's a social climate in some areas that says this is more the role of the family. Back to the Kavanaugh Blasey Ford hearings. Do you know, did schools actually um, run the hearings? Did they, they show them in class? Did they show excerpts? What, what did your reporting show in that regard? You know, there wasn't a universal response, but we heard from some teachers who said this was sort of an unavoidable news moment. Um, and so some of them showed uh, clips of the hearings in their class to have discussions. Some of them uh, allowed students to live stream it and allowed some to Just on their out. phones even. Yes. Um, and then a lot of them are having conversations about how did we get to this moment? I think there's a lot of assumptions among older adults about what they're bringing to the table in, in how they think about the Kavanaugh hearings. We heard from a school in San Francisco that was having actually a teach-in on Anita Hill. Um, we're hearing schools talking about the gender balance in the Senate and some less controversial issues uh, that aren't related to sex and consent, but are related to, say, the separation of powers. We've got all three branches at play here, and there are some basic questions that students can toss about in their mind. Why is the Supreme Court so important? Why are so Pe people so emotional about it? What does it mean when a party has control of the Senate? What would it look like if this confirmation hearing were happening when the president and the Senate were of different parties? Evie Blood of Education Week, thank you. Thank you.